Okay, so, uh, yes, women and society in 18th century England. We're going to be looking at a, a group of women called the Blue Stockings. Uh, the screen looks very fuzzy, and I don't know why. It's not usually like that, is it? Is it, is it, is it like that? Was it like that last week? Not really. Is it readable? Okay, let me know if it actually gets to the point where it's not readable or you feel that it's damaging your eyes. Um, prints at the front here. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know why that's like that. Um, don't, really, don't really get that. This is something. Ah, okay. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> that's a bit better, isn't it? Okay then, so away we go then. Um, I want to start by, again, sort of a little bit of background here, because uh, we talked about the political and social background, but philosophically and culturally, the society was moving, uh, you know, really very, very quickly. We did talk a bit about uh, witches last week, about how the, the crime in the 17th century was to be a witch, but in the 18th century, the crime would be to accuse somebody else of being a witch, because witches don't exist. All right? Or to claim to be a witch would be a crime, because you can't claim to be something that doesn't exist. So uh, there's a big change in thinking there. They're no longer punishing people for being witches. Uh, they've accepted, uh, on, on the basis of scientific rationalism, that there's no such thing as a witch. So it's a really big change in people's thinking there. Uh, and it's called the Enlightenment, and it spreads all the way across Europe, um, really its roots go back to the late 16th century, but it doesn't, uh, doesn't really start to be a watershed in society until really the later part of the 17th century. And uh, well, it would, it would vary from country to country, but uh, the, the underlying thing was the idea of scientific method and the scientific approach to understanding the world. So uh, Francis Bacon, for example, was uh, alive at the same time as Shakespeare. In fact, there are those who uh, mistakenly put forward the theory that Shakespeare's works were actually written by Francis Bacon, which would really be pretty amazing if he could do all of that, as well as being the father of modern science. He would be the greatest figure in English literature. Um, I don't really accept any ideas except that Shakespeare basically wrote Shakespeare, so... Uh, it would be pretty impossible for Francis Bacon to have achieved all of that in his life. But he did um, pioneer the scientific method in, in, um, in England. And you get people like uh, William Gilbert, William Harvey, developing the understanding of the human body, which again, in the context of witchcraft, was important. One of the things they used to do was stick pins in witches, or women who were supposed sort of accused of being witches, if blood didn't come out. Uh, they would say, well, that person's a witch. But the thing is that they didn't understand that there are veins running through the body and that the, 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 the veins are pumping the, 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 the blood around the body. And there are certain parts of the body where if you choose it carefully, no blood will come out because there's no vein there. Okay, so uh, just that something as simple as that, you know, hadn't been appreciated until people started to study anatomy and study the, the actual way that the human body was put together um, and pioneered... Uh, modern medicine. You got uh, uh, chem uh, chemistry. Uh, Robert Boyle uh, would be one of the, uh, the founders of, of modern chemistry, sort of working with the way that uh, substances interact with other substances. Prints at the front here, look. Um, so, yeah, uh, you've got a steady development here. I mean, you are going to perhaps want to point out to me that these are all men, and yes, they were all men, but, but they do lead to a change in atmosphere, a change in the way that society uh, just is looking at the world in general, and that ends up having an influence on uh, women's position in society. And, um, and then, yes, in 1660, you've got this uh, Royal Society. Hi, yeah, you've got Prince at the front here. Uh, you've got the Royal Society... Uh, which was a sort of basically a scientific uh, society. And it had increasingly a uh, very, very big influence. And even from relatively early days, uh, there were uh, 
okay, only a small number of women, but there were some women involved with it. So uh, I just want to set what we're doing today against this background of the Enlightenment. And uh, finally, the Royal Observatory uh, with astronomy, astrology, uh, sorry, sorry, astronomy, uh, not astrology, astronomy, and um, e e mapping the skies. And again, I want uh, so one or two very, very dedicated women um, who uh, contributed to our understanding of you know, how the planets move and uh, the stars and different um, comets and the way that the, the, the whole, you know, got, got a sense of, from our point of view, what we're actually seeing up there. Because, of course, uh, not that long before, people had no idea at all. They thought that, the, that, that it was all the world, everything else was turning around the world, and the world was just staying still, and everything else was moving around it. And then they slowly started to realize, oh, no, we're not the center of everything. Uh, but for a long time, they thought the sun was the center of everything. And then they started, to, no, not even the sun. The sun's not the Some things go around the sun, but... but but a lot of other things don't, like the stars and so on. So uh, they, they were slowly developing their understanding of that, which, of course, again, helps to get a sense of perspective, all right? If ever you're feeling upset about, you know, life on this planet and who might have won the elections in America or something, you can always think about, you know, how huge space is and how, t how tiny and unimportant we are, really, when it comes down to it. But people didn't really know that or see that, um, you know, in the... 15th and 16th centuries, and it's only um, as the 17th century progresses that people start to think in those terms. Uh, so, um, Isaac Newton uh, formulating the laws of motion, the idea of uh, gravity, uh, that, that th things fall because there's a special kind of force that, that, that makes things fall, and so on. Um, all of these things are, are kind of progressing in England during the, uh, you know, from the late 16th century on through into the 17th century. And together, this sort of scientific rationalism produces a new way of looking at the world that we call the Enlightenment. All right. Uh, the Age of Reason, it's also called. It's not just an English thing, I'm just mentioning the English uh, influences. It's obviously something that's going on all over Europe, and it has a philosophical basis as well. Um, I'm just looking at the scientific basis here. Um, so, yeah, superstition is essentially having to take a back seat. Uh, all kinds of superstition, I mean, the idea of witches, whether witches exist, but, but also some of the some of the religious questions start to fade away. They don't become, it's not a matter of death whether you believe that Jesus Christ is really in the, the, the blood and in the, in the bread and wine that they uh, have in the church ceremony. They're not going to burn you for it anymore. Okay? Um, attitudes are changing at all kinds of levels. Uh, last witch hanged in 1729, and the Witchcraft Act essentially taking the position that there's no such thing anyway as a witch. And the only penalty was for pretending to be one. And uh, this ongoing uh, process of scientific inquiry, things are being proved by rational processes. And that becomes the paradigm for uh, figuring out what's, what, what, what's really going on um, in, in terms of the laws of nature and... Uh, the realities of the world we live in. The Bible just didn't have all the answers. And political and economic issues become uh, much more paramount. Religious issues take a back seat. I mean, the early modern period, the 16th and early 17th centuries, religion is really at the for forefront of, of so, so much. People are spending their lives thinking about you know, am I really going to go to heaven when I die? And, and it was kind of the central issue. And then people start thinking, well, we're here. We're on this planet. Let's try and sort things out here. We've got a lot, we've got a lot of problems going on. And we've got a lot of things to, to learn and find out uh, in this world. So uh, the whole focus of society starts to change. Uh, there's still discrimination in England against Catholics. Uh, they don't have 
They don't have full rights. They're not allowed to uh, op openly worship and have their own churches, for example. Uh, that comes in the 19th century. But, but the discrimination against them is basically, it's not, it's not religious discrimination, it's a political thing. Since the gunpowder plot in uh, the early 17th century, when Catholics had a jolly good try at killing uh, you know, the king and all the, <laughs> every, all the politicians, and they tried to blow up Parliament, um, it, it, it was more of a political issue than a religious one. It's not whether they believe in you know, the Virgin Mary or something. It, it's, you know, are they going to try and kill our king and take over our country? So it's a political issue rather than uh, a religious one. Um, and so if we start looking at the 18th century, what sort of world it was, it was a world of, you know, banks. It was a world of coffee shops. You've got the middle class growing up. You've got consumerism, all these big markets that are opening up. We talked last week about the, the British Empire and how it was, uh, you know, largely about markets for things like coffee and sugar and tea and spices and, and cotton and things like that. So um, it's a world of consumerism, a world of trade, technological development with the Industrial Revolution coming in at the end of the, or the later part of the 18th century. Much more like our lives today, um, even though people were still going around, you know, with horses and things, they didn't have motor cars, they didn't have um, computers or anything, or electricity even, but their lives are much more recognisably like our lives than the um, 17th century. In fact, if you look at a picture of 18th century London, you can see, well, yeah, I can sort of see it. I mean, you can actually see quite a lot of those buildings still there today, all right? They've been, you know, there are high-rise buildings kind of mixed in with them now, but, but you know, you can sort of see, well, yes, yes, you know, the, the, they, they put asphalt on the roads and they've got motor cars going along them, but, but that's, you know, sort of, it's, it's kind of recognisable as... Um, you know, not too, not too far away from our present world. Uh, there's another picture of the service, the same scene, basically. So, uh, yeah, we, we, we talked about the fact that, uh, obviously, it was women who were mostly discriminated against when it came to witchcraft. And that uh, once you start changing that belief in witchcraft, you're, you're looking at a change in the attitude towards women. And also, you, we're talking in that early modern period, 16th, 17th century, a tremendous amount of anxiety about women. I mean, it wasn't just that they hated women, they, they feared women. I mean, witchcraft was a symptom of that fear. They feared woman as the, 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 the Eve that, that took the apple and so on uh, from the snake in the Garden of Eden. And uh, you get all these um, symptoms of male anxiety that we looked at in the early modern period. And then those symptoms sort of seem to lessen a bit during the 18th century. Once there's a world out there again of, um, you know, action, empires to be won, wars to be fought... Uh, economic fortunes to be made and all those sorts of things. Um, women, men, you know, men, men have got their role back again, as it were. They, they, they can be heroes in that sort of environment. Um, so also the heroism of the female martyrs of the 16th century was fading away. So, uh, you know, that, that kind of paradigm of women who... You know, if, if they could suffer like that, you know, what, why, what's wrong with you men? Why can't you suffer? You know, and this, this sort of um, men kind of being or kind of teased or bullied by, by the government for not being, for, you know, for, like, why, should, why shouldn't you put up with things? Look at what those women put up with. Are you not as, you're not as strong as a woman? What's wrong with you? Okay, the men weren't being challenged in that sort of way anymore. That, that little paradigm, that kind of... Uh, construct uh, was, was becoming irrelevant. And instead, you've got all these um, uh, opportunities of empire building, uh, and uh, yeah, you've got actual war, and you've got economic development. Uh, these all give men more of a sort of role in the society 
that, that, that lessens that sort of anxiety that men um, seem to have quite extensively in the early modern period against women. So, uh, conversely, this meant that it wasn't necessarily a particularly good time for women. All right, they're being pushed into the kind of narrow life. You know, we're the, we're the men, we've got this under control, we're fighting the wars, we're developing the economy, we're building up the empire. You sort of stay quietly at home and, and, and look after the house and raise the children and to, to stick to your traditional role, all right? So uh, women were being uh, kind of pushed into uh, stereotype roles uh, during the 18th century, partly as a consequence of the way that um, society was developing at the time. And... Yeah, I think we saw this a little bit last week, that, that poor people were being exploited even more than ever, really. Um, so you get all sorts of social problems growing up during the 18th century, quite shocking uh, levels of uh, depravity and poverty and criminality and all sorts of um, evils of, 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 of a developing society, really, because uh, as the cities uh, get more and more people coming into them, uh, you've got people, a sort of underclass growing up of people who just really don't have much to lose. They've lost hope in a society that's not offering them anything really very much. So uh, we saw last week how the um, poor were being pushed off the land by the Enclosures Acts, and as they went into the cities, uh, they very often found that... Um, Either the environment was, a, a, for some, a sense of sort of hopelessness, alcoholism, um, cheap gin <laughs> was, was sort of uh, very readily available. Okay, um, and uh, yeah, you can see that this is largely uh, this is this is sort of showing the evils of alcoholism. This is uh, a painter and engraver called uh, Hogarth. Um, H-O-G-A-R-T-H, very famous um, illustrator of his society during the 18th century, shows us, you know, exactly the, the sort of um, evils and the, the nastinesses, the injustices, all of the... the he, he's very honest, uh, and he, he just gives these sort of insights, which say more than, you know... Uh, a thousand words, you know, they say a picture says more than says a thousand words. Well, they say they certainly, you know, you see something like that and you think, oh my God, you know, that's the society that people were, poor poor people. Not not all poor people, because some poor people were, would be working, they'd have a job and they wouldn't be able to be out on the streets like that, you know, getting drunk and, um, you know, forgetting about anything. Um, and in fact, in terms of attitudes towards the poor, the idea was growing up that you've got two kinds of poor. You've got the deserving poor who deserve uh, to be helped and looked after. You've got the undeserving poor who are lazy, alcoholic, um, criminal. So uh, attitudes towards the poor in general are changing here. Um, but just between 20 years, the first 20 years that we have records for the London Foundling Hospital for Abandoned Children over 16,000 babies were taken to that one hospital in London over a 20-year uh, period. Uh, nearly all of them were never reclaimed. And that, every one of those babies had a mother. Okay, so we're talking about 16,000 mothers. All right, so there's a large number of people, okay, that are in this sort of state where, for, for some reason or other, they simply can't look after their child. It may not be for alcohol. I mean, that's painting a particularly um, particular picture. Um, but uh, for, for economic reasons, these women were not able to look after their children. Uh, yeah, a lot of children and a lot of mothers. And uh, some of these, you know, it's, it's, there's, there's a sort of pathos, the sadness to the records that they've got. The hospital has still got uh, records uh, of, uh, you know, particular individuals. This one is uh, Florel Burney, who was born in um, 1758. And uh, it says the parish where she was born. And uh, 
She wasn't baptized, that is, she didn't go through the church ceremony. It says, pray uh, in particular uh, care of this child uh, as it will be called for again. We don't know what happened to little uh, Florel Bat Bernie, whether she was called for again. Um, there's no record of what happened to her afterwards. But that little bit of cloth there, up in the left-hand corner, would be taken from her mother's dress so that it could be proved that that was her child if she ever did go back to collect her child. Okay, you sort of wonder what happened to that poor little thing, you know, uh, lost somewhere in the middle of the 18th century in a very, um, very uh, strict, um, severe, dangerous society because about 20% of all the children, never mind the ones, that, the ones that ended up as orphans, had a much greater chance of dying, but about 20% of all children born in, in, at that time uh, were, were going to die before they reached the age of two. Okay? And those ones that were taken into the hospitals and orphanages, well, they had an, an even greater, a much greater chance of dying because there was very often neglect. Some of these places would have been, you know, they would have tried to do their best for the children, but in other cases they were neglected and abused.